if anyone can hear or see me or see my presentation, please let me know. Hi everyone, if people are logged in and are watching, I apologize. We are still trying to figure out what's going on with the room um, at Webnographer to see if we're broadcasting there. We'll be with you shortly.
Can you hear me too? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? All right, I think we have a good indication that people in Portugal can now hear me. So um, thank you for your patience. Um, it's an important skill. Um, what we'd like to do is spend uh, a little time with uh, this topic. All you need is love and UX research. My name is Thomas Sharon, and uh, I'd like to say first, hola, Portugal. Um, I'm a researcher, a UX researcher at Google. Uh, today you can find uh, at the Home Depot, you can buy two Googles for uh, $398, uh, which is a, a very good deal, so go for it. Um, I'm also the, the author of this book, It's Our Research. Uh, this is a book for UX practitioners. If you're not a UX practitioner, um, this is not a book for you. My publisher doesn't like me saying that, but that's the truth. Um, and I know in Portugal you don't really like baseball, but uh, I'm a baseball fan here. I'm a fan of Boston. Um, these are my boys. I trained them from early age on uh, UX, and this is my uh, my new addition to the family, and she is uh, for now exempt for, for this. Um, what I want to tell you about is about a book that I'm currently working on. Uh, the temporary name is Lean UX Research for Entrepreneurs. This is the address. 
uh, up there, leanuxresearch.launchrock.com. If you'd like, um, if you'd like to get a, a free chapter when it's ready, just uh, sign up with your email. I promise not to spam you, um, and I promise eternal life in heaven uh, or a free copy of the book. We'll see if you share this uh, page with your startup founder or friends. Um, this is my this is my uh, Twitter um, handle. Feel free to tweet during this uh, this talk, and even after that, ask me uh, anything or um, you know ask me to comment, ask me questions about anything I talked about, and even later, I'm pretty much um, extremely available on uh, Twitter. So I want to start with the problem first. And this is, this is a visual way of, of, of showing you the problem. The problem is that startup founders now hear this from every direction. UX, UX. UX is important. You have to do UX. You have to have good UX. VCs are not looking at you if you're not uh, investing in UX. And you must have a beautiful and consi consistent UX. Um, This is what uh, UX people would like you to know. Uh, a lot of people use the term UI UX. So um, UX is one thing. UI is a very small part of it. Uh, interface design and visual design is UI. UX is everything you see uh, on the left. Um, Another way of, of understanding what UX is is that uh, it solves problem. And to solve problem, UX has a lot of things under this umbrella. It has visual design. It has information architecture, interaction design, usability, user research, and content strategy. All of these are UX, not just the design of your interface. And uh, I started by saying that I'm a user experience researcher. I've been at Google with, for you know, the far, five, past five years or so. And uh, currently, I'm a researcher in uh, Google Search. And when I say uh, user experience research, not a lot of people understand what I'm talking about. So I'd like to first explain what is user experience research. So here it is. It's um, a discipline that is providing insights into product users, their perspectives, and their abilities to the right people at the right time. And I live, I, I'll leave it for a moment here. Um, the key word here is insights, OK? Um, and these insights come uh, based on the different studies that we do. It's really important to understand that the first rule of user experience research, and I know it's going to sound weird coming uh, from the mouth of a user experience researcher is don't listen to users. And feel free to tweet, uh, to tweet that. Uh, again, first rule of research is don't listen to users. Instead, you should observe their behavior. And um, I, want, I want to briefly explain why I don't listen to users. And I do that because of the psychology or what I know about the psychology of attitude and behavior, or the difference between attitude and behavior. Here's a study um, uh, to demonstrate that. This is research that was done many years ago. So students were asked about their attitude toward cheating. So uh, they, they put, you know, gave them questionnaires and asked them, you know, would you cheat in a test or, or an exam or something like that? And they answered. And then a few weeks after that, given the opportunity to cheat, there was close to zero correlation between attitude toward cheating and actual cheating. So these students said that they would not cheat, but in fact, they cheated. And those of you with good eyes um, can see that this is from 1937. So it's 80 something years ago. And some people tell me, well, Tomer, it's very nice, but uh, people change, behavior changes over time. And the truth is that it doesn't. Behavior and human behavior doesn't change so much. Um, 
And to prove that, I'll, I'll tell you about another study that was done to check the same thing, to see what is the difference or the relationship between attitude and behavior. So researchers in, in the UK went to a public bathroom, and they put a stand outside of the bathroom, and everyone coming out of the bathroom, they asked them, did you wash your hands after you finished your business there? And 99% of people said, yes, we washed our hands. And, um, and the, the researchers also put a, a, a hidden camera inside the bathroom and actually counted the number of people who washed their hands. So 64% of women and 32% of men actually wash their hands. So this is, again, the difference between what people say they do and what they actually do. All right? There's a very big difference for, for many reasons, and we're not going to go into that, but for many reasons, there's a big difference. Um, so generally speaking, entrepreneurs, which is a, a topic I'm interested in these days, entrepreneurs have no time and budget to spend on learning from their users. But many of them are, are you know, tight on time and budget. And I decided to, when I, when I realized that, I decided to stop what I'm doing at least and uh, start talking with these entrepreneurs and understand what are the reasons and what's going on. So in the past year, I interviewed about 200 startup founders, VCs, and UX thought leaders. And I asked them about, about different things related to uh, learning from their users. And I want to share with you what I found. Um, very, very, very interesting things. So the first uh, kind of amazing thing uh, to me is that only 12% of startup founders and VCs know what is user experience. Not, I'm not referring to know how to do a good user experience or, or not. I'm referring to just the definition. What is user experience? I asked them, in your opinion, what is the definition of user experience? Only 12% of them were right, and I was very generous. Even, even uh, definitions that were kind of close, I counted as, as correct. Okay, so not a lot of people even know what UX is, or a lot of people don't know what UX is. Another interesting fact is that a startup idea, in 86% of the cases, is born from a founder's personal pain. So a founder had a problem and decided that this problem is worth solving, and therefore he or she established or founded a company, a startup company. Another finding is that ideas are mostly for products or services, which sounds reasonable, but um, the fact is that startups do not obsess about a problem to solve first, okay? So they first think about a, a solution, a product or a service, and they don't obsess about the problem that they solve or they want to solve. I want to give an example of a company that um, did obsess about the problem first. So this is called a, a jitterbug phone. This phone is for the elderly. Uh, they, this, the company that created this phone thought about this phone when they worked on their new phone. So uh, the similarities between the two are first the size. A lot of uh, older uh, smartphone users uh, move the phone from their ear to their mouth when they speak or want to hear. They don't have a model, a mental model of understanding that they can be heard even if they, their phone is on their ear. With this old phone, rotary phone, people were used to the fact that one side of the phone is on their ear, another side is on their mouth, and they don't need to move it. So this phone, this new phone, is very big, and it reaches their ear and mouth. The other thing is this cover, you see this uh, gray uh, topping on the uh, top part of the phone. This one blocks, this is a rubber that blocks all the noise from the outside so they can hear very well. This is again something that can, could have been done or was done by elderly people when they used a rotary phone um, to block noise uh, from the outside. Um, another thing here, uh, very big uh, numbers, uh, simple buttons, yes and no, 
not complicated. There's not much to it. When you open the when you open the phone, uh, you hear a ringtone as you could with uh, with this old phone. So they obsessed about the problem. One of the problems of elderly users, and then created uh, their solution, their phone. Um, a lot of startup founders perceive their their company as a, as a coding exercise, and um, in many cases it's okay. But a coding exercise is something that they think does not require insights from users. Users have no idea how to code or what to code, so therefore they're not they should not be involved. The good thing. Uh, and this is, and I'm not being sarcastic here. The good thing that I found is that founders ask themselves excellent questions. I asked them, what are the questions that you ask yourself along the way about users? And they had excellent questions, and I want to show you these questions. So these are um, the top six questions that they ask themselves. And the percentage of there is how many of the of the uh, of the of the founders I interviewed ask themselves uh, this question. So 97% ask a very good question, who are my customers? Or 95% ask, do people need my product? Very important question. Okay. Now, the, the not-so-good finding is that founders answer these excellent questions in invalid and unreliable ways. And uh, again, I want to share how they do that. So uh, to the question, and this is representative of most of the founders I interviewed, not all them, but most of them, this is pretty much representative. And these are founders I interviewed from all over the world, including Portugal. A few of you here uh, uh, participated in this research. So uh, who are my customers? Uh, people go to analytics to understand that and create, in some cases, uh, what I call bullshit personas. I see I have a typo here. Bullshit personas. Uh, bullshit personas are personas that are not based on research, that are invented uh, assumption personas, no base in reality. Second question, do people need my products? Uh, the answer is, the way they answer that is, of course they do. Of course they need our product. Just the fact that we develop it means that people need it. Third question, is the product usable? How they find out the answer to that question? They, they tell me that they focus on UX, that UX is extremely important to them, that they have a designer, they hire the designer, and that they use the product on their own, and therefore they know it is usable or not. When they ask themselves, is, is their product better than the competition, the answer is that uh, they do things differently, and if I insisted, they said that they compare uh, uh, feature lists. They take the feature list of their competition, they take their own feature list, compare that, and see who's better. Decide by that who's better. Um, to the question, is our product getting better over time? Um, people say, we improve it all the time, so of course it is. How they know that this is true, I have no idea. And the last question that um, they ask is, do people want the product? And the way they answer that is, uh, they just ask their sister, and she says yes. All right, so I'll, I'll give you a minute with these uh, questions and answers. Obviously, these are invalid and unreliable ways to answer those questions. And I think I know that user experience research practices can help you and these people uh, who have these questions, these excellent questions, answer these questions uh, reliably and in a valid way. Um, if you don't do that, that's a huge, huge risk. Um, if you guess what the answers are, if you think you know the answers, you're taking a huge, huge risk. And what I'd like to uh, explain is what research can help you with. So it can help you um, with this. If you are badly executing the wrong plan, meaning um, you're product is unusable and nobody needs it, that's bad. Um, a better situation is that you're perfectly executing the wrong plan. So you're actually working on a, uh, you're creating a very usable product. The problem is that nobody needs it. Another situation that can happen is that you're badly executing the right plan. So you know what people need. People actually need your product, 
but it's not usable. They can't use it because it's not friendly to use and easy to use. And the perfect situation to which I'd like you to get is to perfectly execute the right plan. You're, you're developing a product that people need, and this product is usable and beautiful. And this is a way for me to put it uh, on, a, on, a, on a graph. So wrong plan, right plan, bad execution, perfect execution. Let's go over the quadrant. So when you're working on the wrong plan with bad execution, there's, you're pretty much you're not doing any research. When you are uh, creating a, a, a perfect or a usable product that nobody needs, it means you're mostly doing usability testing. When you are uh, badly executing uh, a product, so it's not usable, but you are working on the right product, it means your research mostly involves discovery research, what we call, or generative research to generate ideas. And the best way to go uh, is, of course, uh, work on the right plan uh, and perfectly execute the product. This means that you're doing UX research. Um, what I want to do now, uh, before I move on to talking a little bit about a method that can, yet you can implement tomorrow morning and um, that can help you with, uh, with your research, with finding out what is the right product to work on, uh, I'd like to open it up for questions. Now, I know. This is going to be kind of uh, challenging with Hangout here, but let's uh, let's try it anyway. So there's a feature in Hangouts that allows you to ask questions. I'm going to open it now. So submit your questions, and I'll I'll see them here, and um, and we'll take it from there. So go ahead.
So uh, you've got a question about should research be incremental? I'm not um, not sure what you mean here. Uh, focus on small things. So okay, I think I, I understand. So um, a, a, an important aspect of research is that it's continuous. Um, that uh, you have to do that. Uh, that you have to do that uh, all the time. So, uh, in a in a perfect world, you would start with upfront research to understand what people need, and then you start creating that and get feedback on that. That's almost never the case, even in in big companies with with a lot of resources. Um, what I suggest is to start small. So yes, definitely incremental. Test the small things. Um, always be in touch with users. Never ask them what they need. Never ask them what's their feedback. Never respond to complaints. I mean, you can do that, um, but focus on having them respond to a design. So uh, ask them to use something and watch them use it. This is a usability test. Um, Use usertesting.com. It's very cheap, very quick. Give people an opportunity to use something, have them record themselves doing that while thinking out loud. You get good, good, good feedback that you need. Um, in the discovery stage, if you have time to do upfront research, go watch people use products or solve problems today without your product. Watch them do that. Don't even talk to them. Just watch them. If you don't understand something, ask them a question about what you see. Um, I'll, I'll soon explain, I'll, I'll soon discuss a, a, a technique that, that you can use called experience sampling, um, again, for exposing people's needs or uncovering people's needs. But uh, yeah, incrementally test and evaluate everything that you have with users. Again, don't ask them for feedback. If you have the thing, give it to them, ask them to use it, shut up and watch. That's what you need to do. Um, let's see if we have another question. Should research be incremental? OK. Carlos, I hope I, I answered your question. If not, let me know. Um, another question is, uh, I think I'm understanding it correctly, who is at the discovery stage? Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by that. Um, I'm not sure that you, what you mean by that, but uh, please explain uh, so I can answer. Okay, second question from Pedro. How does ethnography fit into the picture? Excellent question. So ethnography is exactly what I talked about earlier. Watching people uh, do what they do and um, just let them be in their own uh, environment and, um, and just watch what they do. Look at how they solve a problem or solve the problem that you're interested in today without your product and try and understand what are their pain points, what are their delights, and how you can help with that. So um, there's a lot more to it, 
and um, I'm happy to explain more uh, over t Twitter. Um, I just want to answer a couple more questions and then uh, move on to experience sampling, which is a way of understand a, a way to replace ethnography or complete ethnography. Uh, so um, I suggest that if we don't have any other questions, I'm going to move on to that. So let me switch to uh, the slides. And if we have more questions, please keep them coming. And I'll answer them in the end if we have some more time. All right. So experience sampling is a strategic research technique for uncovering user needs. All right. So uh, if you if you listen carefully, what I'm calling you to do um, is leave the design alone, leave the interface alone, put it aside. Don't turn your your laptop or mobile phone to people and ask for their feedback. Try and uncover what people need. Okay. Um, so. This is a strategic research technique for doing exactly that. Um, in one, in one, um, in one sentence, what is experience sampling? Research participants are interrupted several times a day to note their experience in real time, and and I'll explain. So, um, so. I'll start by saying what, 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 what you get from experience sampling. Okay? After you do experience sampling, which I'll go over in a minute, this is what you get from it. You get insights about what users need. You get ideas for useful product features. You get uh, an understanding about current pain points and delights. And you get data about experience categories. Um, promise I'm going to explain that. I know it's not clear now. So how do you prepare for an experience sampling uh, study? So what you need to do is carefully think about the question that you're going to ask. So I'm going to give an example from Google. Uh, we have a study that we call daily in Google search. We call daily information needs. We wanted to know what people want to know. So we uh, recruited several uh, or a lot, I can't name the, the number, a lot of participants in this study. And we, for three days, we sent them the question, the same question, eight times a day through an app we installed on their phone with their permission. So the question that we asked them over and over and over again was, what did you want to know recently? And it doesn't have to be anything about Google or something that you searched on Google. doesn't matter. We wanted to know what they wanted to know recently. So uh, if you notice, this is a carefully phrased question. So what I'm calling for here is to think about that question. It should be a simple, short question that people can understand. You need to think about how long the study will take, how many alerts, these notifications, we call them alerts, how many alerts, how many alerts are you going to send them? So I said three days, eight times a day, that's 24. Uh, times for this study for a number of participants. Think about that. It's going to affect your um, effort of analyzing the data. Plan an alert to require a total of less than one minute. So we asked people, uh, what did you want to know recently? We also asked them some follow-up questions, but we made sure we tested that again and again before we launched the study that it doesn't take more than a minute because we knew that if it's going to take more than a minute, would uh, people would just drop out of the study. Uh, by the way, I see that, we're, that I'm getting more questions. That's fine. Keep them coming. I'm going to answer everything uh, in the end. So um, the next thing you need to do is to choose a medium. How are you going to send the question to your participants. So it could be SMS, it could be email, it could be over an app or uh, just a phone message. Uh, an app, uh, if you're using Android, if your users are using Android, there's an app that we used at Google, developed by a Google engineer. The app is called PACO, P-A-C-O. Uh, stands for uh, Personal Analytics Companion. And it's also the name of the dog of the developer. 
And uh, Paco lets you do exactly what I'm describing, and they're working on an iOS version uh, as I speak. So that's uh, a medium that can help you. Um, decide how to collect the data. Would it go to a spreadsheet or somewhere else? You need to have all the data in one place so you can quickly start analyzing it. Think, think about that. If you're getting thousands of responses, that's a lot of data to go over. And plan the analysis. How are you going to do that? How are you going to, to classify the data? I'm going to show you an example in a minute. Uh, participants. So um, you need to think about how many participants uh, between I don't know, 10 and 100 is a good number. I know it's a big range, but it's a good number to go for. Um, you need to set expectations. They need to know exactly what you're going to do with them. So we told our participants 24 times, eight times a day over three days. It's going to take less than a minute, so 24 minutes, that's all we're asking. And uh, we need you to be uh, giving us good answers to, to that question. Uh, they asked for examples. We didn't give them examples of answers because we didn't want to bias them. So don't do that. Just uh, make sure they install the app. Make sure the process is working. Practice. Make sure that they they get the notification that you that they uh, submit their answers that you are getting it. Incentivize them. Uh, so at Google we pay them. Uh, I know a lot of startups don't have the budget to pay their study participants. There are other ways. Not every incentive must be monetary. So I suggested to a few startups to have a, a wall of fame um, in their office. So have a wall in your office with, uh, on which you put the names of all the people who helped you develop the product, including study participants. Put their names on this wall, take a picture, uh, tweet about it, post it on Facebook. People love that. So that could be a great incentive. And begin recruiting SAAP. I mean, you need to find participants as soon as possible. Um, and I can talk about uh, how you do that uh, later on over Twitter. I have a, a, re a, great resources, a great resource for that for you. Play by play, what is it that you do? So you launch the study and you track responses, see what people are answering. Adjust participant behavior, clarify, make sure you're getting the answers you are expecting. Um, I remember in one of these studies that we ran, again, the question was, what did you want to know? Recently, people, one, people, one person said, dogs. We have no idea what that person meant by dogs. So we needed to explain, to go back to this participant during the study and say, listen, dogs is not telling us what you want to know. Tell us in your own words what is it that you want to know so we can understand. So do that. Uh, pat participants on the back. Most participants will get it, and they'll give you the answers that you're looking for. Let them know that this is the level of detail that you were expecting. Don't tell them uh, that they're, doing, they're giving you the right answers, because then they'll give you more of the same. You want a range of answers. So tell them that the way they're answering the, the question is very, very good. And begin the analysis as soon as possible. I said I talked about a study that took three days. We began the analysis after the first day. It's a lot of data to deal with. And troubleshoot. If people have problems, they can't submit, and they can't get your notifications, uh, work on these problems and, and understand what's going on. And thank participants. People who are doing a good job, thank them. Tell them that they're doing a good job. Uh, that's going to be helpful for your data. Uh, talking about data, this is how you do the data analysis. You first, before the study, you need to decide on categories. So uh, three times a day, eight, uh, uh, sorry, three days, eight times a day means 24 responses per participant. If we would have used 100 participants, we would have gotten, after three days, 2,400 answers. We would need to classify those uh, after the study. So classification is going by category. So for example, we would say, OK, that person wanted to know about uh, opening hours for a business. So we decided on a certain category. And we said, OK, this is business related. This is uh, opening hours related, and so on and so forth. Decide on these categories beforehand. Then classify the data. Do it as a team. Check yourselves. Do, do a double classification. One person does it, then another person does the same thing uh, for the same data without seeing what the other first person did uh, to make sure that you're classifying uh, the data in, a, in the correct way. Here's an example. I spent some time here. 
uh, this is a, a fake imaginary study. Let's say I'm, I'm, I want to work on an app for note taking. So this is a question I would ask in an experience sampling research. What was the reason you recently used a piece of paper to write something down? And then I would send that to people once a day, three times a day. It doesn't matter. I mentioned three days, eight times a day. It doesn't have to be like that. I heard of experience sampling studies that it was reasonable to send one request per week for three months. That's fine. As long as you ask the same question over and over again to get the range of answers that you're looking for. So here is what I got. These are about 70 answers to that question. I hope you can see that. And if you uh, just look at the data, look at the answers, you can very clearly, even without hardcore quantitative analysis, you can very quickly see what are the categories of answers that, that you're getting, right? Uh, have a look at that. Um, a lot of to-dos, um, a lot of uh, classes, uh, class-related notes, and, and, and so on and so forth. So um, this, is, this is what I meant by uh, experience categories, okay, that I mentioned earlier. You understand uh, these very, very quickly. Moving on. Uh, just categories. Sometimes your planned or predefined categories are not right. Sometimes you decide on a category that is too big, so you need to divide it into three subcategories, so go for that, or a category that you don't see a lot of responses related to that, so cancel it. Clean the data as you go, get rid of, of the dogs. Um, I'm, I, I see a question that is relevant right now. Did you just do this study in English? Uh, we started in English in the U.S. We expanded to other countries, so we do that in, in other languages, cultures, and countries uh, as well. Yes. Um, another thing that you can do is generate frequency chart. This is uh, on the right here, uh, an example of a frequency chart. So these are, for example, the cat. Each one, each bar is a category, so you understand. Uh, the frequency of responses related to a specific category. So we see what is the most popular category and what is the least popular category. Identify themes. What do you see that comes out of these, of these responses? What important things you learned? These are the themes, the emerging themes from, uh, from a study. And eyeball the data. Just what we, what we did a minute ago. Just read the data, read the answers, you get a pretty good understanding of what's going on when, when you read the, the data. So I just spent, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes about experience sampling. You have, uh, this is just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, if you want to have more knowledge about this method, uh, this is a book to, to read. Uh, three authors, I can't pronounce um, all of their names, uh, Joel Heckner, Jennifer uh, Somit, and the last person, which is the lead guy here, and is also a TED speaker, speaks about flow, is Mihaly, uh, I can't pronounce his last name, but Mihaly, M-I-H-A-L-Y. Um, look for him on TED. Uh, he's, a, he's a great guy, and he is the, you know, the leader for, uh, the lead author uh, for this book. All right, so a quick recap. Obsess about a problem to solve first. Remember that, that's, that's key. Never ask what people need because humans suck at predicting the future. We have no idea. Instead, observe what they do. Just watch people, watch what they do. Never ask what is their feedback. So something that I guess get asked a lot, uh, by startup founders is for feedback about their product. I refuse to answer this question because I'm not their audience. Never ask what people's feedback is because they'll tell you what you want to hear. You're being nice to them. You want good feedback. They know you founded this company. They know you're looking for approval. They'll say whatever you, it is you want to hear. Instead, just watch them use it. If you have something to show, you have something to use. It doesn't have to work. You can print it out on a piece of paper, give them a pencil, ask them to do something. If you want to sell books through your site, ask them, here's a pencil, here's our homepage, 
you want to buy a book, what would you do next? And have them show you what they do. So watch them use it. And sample people's experience to identify problems and needs. That's, uh, that's what experience sampling uh, can help you with. Um, this is all I have for you. We have a few minutes for, uh, for uh, more questions uh, as they go. I'll start with a question I got along the way. So um, how to persuade your business partner to invest into UX research? So actually, this is what my first book is about. Um, in order, in, you know, if I, if I can summarize that in one sentence, in order for people to want to do research, and given that they do research, is follow what research uh, shows you to do, follow its results, they have to feel that this is theirs as much as you feel it's yours. So if your business partner is hard on um, UX research, doesn't want to invest anything in that, or doesn't want to invest a lot of that, uh, just if you have something, have people use it and watch it. Have that person watch it for 10 minutes. That's it. So uh, if you have 30 bucks, go to usertesting.com. Purchase one credit, have one user perform one task with your product, and watch it together. This is extremely helpful in understanding what research can help you with. So just do that. Spend those 30 bucks. Um, watch three users. You'll get confused, what I call confused in a good way. So uh, you don't really know what to do because people behave in so many different ways. So do that. Watch people. The more you watch people, don't ask them anything. Just watch them complete tasks that you thought they could complete with your product website. Usertesting.com is also good for mobile devices, so you can do that as well. Um, let's see. Do we have more questions? I see an earlier question about uh, where is ethnography fit into the picture. Uh, just to add to what I answered earlier, um, ethnography is very good up front, before you have a product, before you start coding. Uh, again, this is almost never the case. You, I, know, I know you guys, you always want to code first. Uh, so ethnography is also good uh, as an ongoing process. So do what I do. I, I uh, created a, a, an event for uh, my team called Field Friday. We go outside of the office and we watch users, um, either with their permission or not. It depends on the product. Sometimes we just watch people on the street, train stations, buses, um, or we uh, you know, schedule with them and watch them in their office, at their homes, uh, and watch what they do. Ethnography can help you with that. Um, so this is where it, it fits into the, uh, into the process. I would do that at any stage. Once a month, once a week, whatever you can invest, uh, go outside and watch your users. Don't pitch, don't sell, just watch them use the thing. Okay, let me see if you have any more questions. If not, we'll finish here. Okay, until we have uh, um, one last question, 
Uh, I want to encourage you again to sign up for uh, getting a, a free chapter of my new book when it's ready, uh, leanuxresearch.launchrock.com. And again, I promise eternal life if you share that with your friends and startup founder friends. Um, and if you have more questions that I didn't have time to answer, please uh, catch me over uh, Twitter. Uh, feel free to um, ask me anything by mentioning my name. OK, last question. Do you ever use a hypothesis, or do you use bottom-up? Not sure what you mean by that. Uh, Sabrina. Hi, Sabrina. Um, I can say that with my team, we are working with hypotheses. Hypotheses, sorry. So uh, we do start with what people think their audience, their needs are, and then we provide research to uh, uh, validate or invalidate that. So definitely, yes, we work with uh, hypotheses. Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by uh, bottom up. OK. I suggest that we'll uh, take that to uh, Twitter and uh, continue there. Uh, one, last, uh, one last thing I would like to do is uh, thank, one second, just making sure this is OK, I just want to thank uh, Afonso Santos um, for uh, his help with connecting me with you guys so, and to James Page uh, for organizing this uh, event. Um, so uh, thank you so much for your time. I see I have one more question. I'll take that to uh, Twitter uh, for time's sake. So uh, thanks again, and we are finishing this broadcast. Thank you very much.